Know yourself that you may know God. And if there was a subtitle, it would go like this. Becoming your authentic or true self. Becoming, and you'll hear this phrase a lot, authentic self or true self, as opposed to false self. And we, two weeks ago, man, it, it feels like it's been like months since I've been here. <laughs> I guess I really miss this place. Uh, it's only been two weeks. Uh, but I mentioned this last time when we're here together. It is impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. It is impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally Im immature. This is the premise in which we're building this series. And if you don't believe this, if you, if you don't think this is true, then we're all wasting our time. Because then you're not going to do the hard work of digging in. You're not going to do the hard work of going beneath the surface. You're not going to do the hard work of get into that, that, that portion of iceberg that is hidden away. Some people will say that, that, you know, you need to know God first so you can know yourself. And that, that statement will be absolutely true. But often when you don't know yourself first, that's what keeps you from knowing God. It's kind of cyclical. And if you remember last week uh, in your small group, we talked about Saul. Because he didn't know who he was, he was unable to press in to know more of who God is. And so, here's the thing. Whichever comes first, whether knowing God first or knowing you first, if there is a disconnect between the knowledge of God and knowledge of yourself, then that's when you get stuck in your spiritual and emotional state. And I've seen this over and over again in, in ministry. Your growth is stunted. So there's a story uh, Pastor Pete Scuzzero, who, who wrote uh, The Emotionally Healthy Spirituality and Discipleship and, 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 and Church as well, he, he talks about in the book how his wife, Jerry, approached him one summer and said, hey, honey, I'm, I'm taking my four little girls, our daughters, to my mother's house down the shore. I'm leaving you for, for a month because, you know, we're, we're stuck in this small apartment with all this traffic noise. And, no, no. You stay here, do your church. <laughs> I'm, I'm taking my kids to my mom's for four weeks, for a whole month. Now, you have to understand, he's been rejecting her plea for 10 years. Every time she said, can we go? No. Can we go? No. But when she mentioned this, all he could think about was, what would people think? We're married. We're supposed to be one flesh. And you want to separate? I'm a senior pastor. I make all the decisions. Whatever I say goes. I can't be alone. But what was really going on okay, with him was that he didn't want to be abandoned. He wanted his wife to take care of the quote-unquote wounded boy in him. So he was concerned with what his Italian mom would say about all this and what church people would say. But he knew she was right. That they, 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 they needed a break that he need, she needed to take the kids uh, away from all this hustle and bustle. Um, so, like all men do, or most men, we pout, <laughs> right? Um, pout for a while, but then he agreed. And so they had a conversation, they talked together, and they decided that on weekends, she would bring the kids back. So he, she would only be away four, four days out of the week for a whole month. So uh, four times four, 16 days. Um, but then something began to happen. As he spent time alone, he began to discover his true self. On his own, spending time with God, he began to discover his own self. Let, let's pray before we go on and ask the Lord to speak to us. God, our hearts are open, our ears are open. Speak to us, Lord. And would you drown out every other voice that says, oh, you don't need this. Oh, you know all this already. Or for men, this is sissy stuff, man. Like, the, the, why do you want to talk about emotions? But Lord, our desire is to go deep in our spirit. Lord, to, to, uh, to bring up things that, that need to be brought up. To see deep into our hearts. 
that you may do a transforming work in us, Lord, that we may be emotionally and spiritually healthy. So God, uh, again, speak to us, Lord. May your voice just stand out among many other voices. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Feelings, can't live with them, can't live without them. I mean, there seems to be a, a c confusion, especially among Christians, uh, what to do with these feelings. Is it good? Is it bad? Can you trust them? Is it counteractive to, 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 to our spirituality? I mean, there's so many questions that seems to come up. Uh, but for the most part, we neglect or dismiss feelings because we're taught that feelings, what? Can go against the will and the plans of God. But you know what? God has emotions. Did you know that? God has emotions. And we're made in His image. So we have emotions. As a matter of fact, we have a wide range of emotions. Maybe a little too much. But I think because we don't associate emotions like fear and shame with God, of course, God, He's not scared. He's not afraid. There's no, God doesn't feel shame. Because of that, we tend to shy away from those as well uh, because we see them as negative and even sinful. Still, what if? What if God speaks to us in those emotions and feelings? Think about that. So that he, he can help us dig deep into our souls to figure out why these feelings are there and what triggers them. Anyway, research shows that there, there are eight main categories of emotions or feelings with many subcategories. So the main categories are anger, sadness, fear, enjoyment, love, surprise, disgust, and shame. Then I'm going to read a portion from the book. As Pete, Pastor Pete's writing, it never entered my mind that God might be speaking to me in the feeling realm in a way that did not compromise his truth. How could I listen to my desires, dreams, likes, and dislikes? Wouldn't they potentially take the way, take the way of rebellion away from God? So I ignored them. As I said in the previous chapter, most Christians do not think they have permission to consider their feelings, to name them, or express them openly. This applies especially to the more difficult feelings of fear, sadness, and anger. It was anger and depression, however, that finally got me to stop and admit something was desperately wrong. I could no longer stuff them. I began leaking all over my relationships at work and at home. When we deny our pain, losses, and feelings year after year, we become less and less human. We transform slowly into empty shells with smiley faces painted on them. Sad to say, that is the fruit of much of our discipleship in our churches. But when I began to allow myself to feel a wider range of emotions, including sadness, depression, fear, anger, a revolution in my spirituality was unleashed. I soon realized that a failure to appreciate the biblical place of feelings within our larger Christian lives has done extensive damage, keeping free people in Christ in slavery. So we smile while we're depressed. We say God is good when we have no joy. We put on a mask so we, can't, we can pretend to be nice Christians when there's turmoil that's just brewing inside. The point is this. In order to begin your journey into emotionally healthy spirituality, we must, we must give ourselves permission to feel. There, I said it. Whew. Right? Everyone take a deep breath. You have permission to feel. And I can say that because God has emotions. The difference is this though. It's not exactly the same as human emotions. Why? Because God's emotions are not tainted by sin. Okay? I want you to remember that. The difference is that God's emotions are not tainted by sin like us. Listen to this. And this is just coming straight out of Scripture. Showing that God has emotions. God saw that it was good. The Lord regretted. And I'm not going to give you references. But just straight out of Scripture. I am a jealous God. And God says, I cry out. I gasp and pant. I have loved you with an everlasting love. My compassion is aroused. 
he began to be sorrowful and troubled. This is God, full of joy. And, and I think this is um, King David who says, God, you hate all who do evil. Lord just laughs. Lord took pity. He will take delight in you. God thinks, we think. God wills, we will. God feels, we feel. But even if I, what I, what I just said is true, God has emotions, so we have emotions. The problem is that we are often unaware. We're not aware of our feelings until there are physical or physiological symptoms that surface as a, as a result of repressed feelings. Do you ever, like, you're so stressed and, and you're angry, right? Your body starts to hurt. You get headaches, muscle tension. Your heartbeat just goes up. Your stomach's all knotted and it's churning inside. High blood pressure, sweating. These symptoms appear, especially when we repress or ignore our anger, anxiety, fear, or sadness because they're, quote unquote, not Christian. But can we be honest with ourselves when we have problems, when we have issues, when we have certain feelings? Because here's the thing. When we cut ourselves away from some of these intense emotions, we can easily cut our, ourselves away from God. For 26 years, I live without emotions. Literally. Do you, uh, you ever see this t-shirt? The many emotions of Batman. <laughs> Happy, sad, angry, nervous, <laughs> guilty, innocent, affectionate, exhausted, anxious, sick, curious, sleepy. I mean, they're all the same. And that was me. I had one face for all my emotions. People call me stoic. But after Jesus, now I cry, I laugh, <laughs> and sometimes even become a little feisty. All thanks to Jesus, I, I can feel. I mean, the freedom I feel when I can express myself without looking over my shoulder to see if someone's watching me, I mean, that's incredible. You guys should try it sometime. Be honest. And express yourself. So according to Ignatius of Loyola, who founded the Jesuit movement, we're not to blindly live our lives dictated by our feelings. That's not what we're talking about at all. But realize that God can speak to us. He can come to us in, through those feelings. But we must distinguish and discern whether God is speaking or the enemy is speaking through these emotions. It could be the enemy trying to mess, you up, uh, mess us up, mess with us. Or it could be God trying to, to, to help us to respond appropriately to some of these emotions so that we can make wise decisions. What does the Bible say in, in 1 John 4, 1? Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Pastor Pete writes in the second chapter, one of our greatest obstacles in knowing God is our own lack of self-knowledge. So we end up wearing a mask before God, ourselves, and other people. And we can't become self-aware if we cut off our humanity out of fear of our feelings. This fear leads to unwillingness to know ourselves as truly as we truly are and stunts our growth in Christ. In the cry of the soul, Dan Allender and Tremper Longman summarize why awareness of our feelings is so important. Listen to this. Ignoring our emotions is turning back our back on reality. Listening to our emotions ushers us into reality. And reality is where we meet God. Where we meet God. Emotions are language of the soul. They're the cry that gives the heart a voice. However, we often turn a deaf ear through emotional denial, distortion, or disengagement. We strain out anything disturbing in order to gain uh, tenuous control of our inner world. We are frightened and ashamed of what leaks into our consciousness. In neglecting our intense emotions, we are false to ourselves and lose a wonderful opportunity to know God. We forget that change comes through brutal honesty and vulnerability before God. So allow yourself to experience the full weight of your feelings. Allow them without censoring them. Then you can reflect and thoughtfully decide what to do with them. Trust God to come to you through them. This is the first step in the hard work of discipleship. 
So we begin to discover our true selves as we are honest with our emotions and our feelings. But here's the thing. There are temptations to cover up our true selves and instead move towards our false selves. And, and you know, when we put, put on the false selves, what are we doing? We're, we're putting on masks that really don't belong to us. So there are three temptations we're going to talk about as we look at Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Now remember, Jesus can to fully attain um, or maintain his true self because it's already grounded in Father's affirmation and uh, love, right? Remember, uh, if you recall the baptism, when Jesus was baptized, baptized by John, what happened? The heavens opened, Holy Spirit comes down, and the Father speaks to the Son, you are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. So there's affirmation of love and acceptance already. So he's, he's working out of his true self 100% of the time. I love this. Quote, living and swimming in the river of God's deep love for us in Christ is at the very heart of true spirituality. The song we sang, I can sing of your love forever. Yeah. When we're in the thickness and the, the fullness of God's love, I mean, what more do we need? So is the love of God your foundation for your identity? That's a good question to ask, ask ourselves. Is the love of God your foundation for your identity? So let's look into three temptations that try to rob us of our, tr uh, our identity and our true selves. Temptation number one, I am what I do. In other words, performance. Matthew 4, 3 says, And the tempter came, the devil came and said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. I mean, at this point, Jesus had nothing to show for. For 30 years, he hasn't done any miracle yet, right? On the surface, he looks like a loser. Nothing to show for. And on top of that, he was hungry. I mean, he, he was in the desert 40 days, 40 nights, no food, no water. Yes, he, he, he's, he's got to be hungry. I'm sure we would be in the same place, right? And, and, and here's the thing. This is the same dilemma we face, right? What have we done to show for? What are our accomplishments, accolades, or awards? And so this tries to rob us of our uh, true self. Temptation number two. I am what others think. In other words, popularity. Devil taunted Jesus to, to throw himself down from the top of the temple and let the angels catch so that people will know, oh, Jesus is somebody. And we are, we're taunted the same way, to prove our worth, to be recognized, to show off who we become. Our esteem skyrockets when we receive uh, praise, but our esteem knows dies, what? When we receive criticism. There's some of us who live or die by what people say or what people think. I remember going to, I think it was my 20-year high school anniversary or re reunion. And looking at the classmates, thinking, thinking to myself, ha, he's bald. Ha, he's fat. Ha, he's got no job. Ha, he's got wrinkles. All the while trying to look as if I was all that when I was not. Reunions are especially bad for this temptation. <laughs> temptation number three. I am what I have. In other words, a possession. And he said to him, the devil said to, to Jesus, all these I will give you. So he's showing the, the, the world. All this if you, I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. And he, what he's saying, I have it all. You have nothing. You're nobody. That's what the devil's trying to say. And, then, and this mentality, very mentality, plagues us, doesn't it? Get more, buy more, keep more. Get more, buy more, keep more. We get bombarded day in, day out. Commercials, right? To, to get more, to buy more, to keep more. Bigger house, more cars, more vacation, more money in the bank. These are things that literally seduce us daily. Bigger things, better things. 
So we, we compete, don't we? We try to outdo the Jones next door. We try to have better things than, than our neighbor, to rise up above everyone else. And at the end of the day, it's the envy that gets the best of us. Now, how about some examples of people living in the false self? Now, I'm going to warn some of you Yankee fans. <laughs> I think there are a number of them. Because, um, uh, yeah. Example of living in false self, Joe DiMaggio. <gasps> Famous Yankee ball player, lived large and alive. I mean, talented, right? But baseball legend, married to, to Marilyn Monroe at, at one point. Had everything he ever wanted until his biography surfaced. Which painted a completely different picture. Self-centered, image conscious, driven, money hungry. That's how he was described under the facade of being a baseball legend. He lived a lie and the public believed in the lie. Now he wasn't a Christian, but what if a Christian lived that way? Sheila Walsh. She was a well-known co-host of the 700 Club. You guys know, remember 700 Club? It's a Christian program. She had a really successful career. But she ended up in a psych ward. And when the psychiatrist asked, who are you? Her answer, I'm the co-host of the 700 Club. No, no, that's not what I meant. Oh, I'm a writer. I'm, I'm a singer. No, no. Who are you? She finally answered, I don't have a clue. And the psychiatrist said, well, that's why you are here. The question was, it was, who are you? And she answered, what she does. She was consumed by what others thought of her, that her soul was slowly being suffocated from the external pressure. She had to be somebody that, that other people expected her to be. But through the low point in her life, she found herself. And is that like many of us? We have to hit low point before we can cry out to God. And God is always there to, to, to rescue us. And her case was an indication of how her false self has become so intertwined with who she was that she had no idea what was going on. And the result? Quote unquote fear, self-protection, possessiveness. So when the self the false self consumes you. This is what, you, what, what ends up having. You have fear, self-protection, possessiveness, manipulation, self-destructive tendencies, self-promotion, self-indulgence, etc. And we see too many examples. I'm telling you, too many examples of uh, Christians, leaders, pastors, who have enormous uh, successful ministries, and yet their the inner life stinks. Their, their family life stinks. And, and, and I know pastors who actually, you know, they pastor church, a church, but also have business. And, and I've seen how they run businesses. No integrity at all. They lie, cheat. Two different faces, right? But living, really living in the false self. And the answer to all this mad madness is, is what? To separate yourself your true self from all the other voices that are trying to get, get your attention. And the only voice you really need to listen is God's voice who has uniquely created you to thrive as God-formed person that you are. Now contrast these two examples with Jesus who lived perfectly in his true self, untainted by whatever the world had to offer. He never swayed from his calling, never. Okay, foregoing pressure from family, friends, strangers, even his own disciples. He didn't, he didn't crumble un, under pressure. And so people thought he was out of his mind. And a lot of people were disappointed, very disappointed, because he didn't meet the expectation that they put on him. And what was his response? He listened without reacting and communicated without antagonizing. When you have conversations with people, especially that could disagree with you, can you actually listen without reacting or communicate without antagonizing? It's really hard, isn't it? 
Unless you're, you know who you are. Unless you're confident of yourself. The crowd wanted a Messiah who would be a political king. Their social worker. Their miracle physician. But he walked the path that was laid out for him. Crucifixion. Death. Death by crucifixion. That was his call. And he did it all out of security and safety of his relationship with the, uh, with the father. So as much as we're pressing to living life that's not our own, we need to know who we are in Christ so that we can live as our true selves no matter what. And I'm going to, to help us in this effort, let me introduce a new term. Differentiation. Differentiation. It refers to a person's capacity to define his or her own life's goals and values apart, that's a key word there, apart from the pressures of those around them. So when, you're, when you have high differentiation, you can know who you are while still having close relationship with other people. It's like, think of it as having the best of both worlds. You live your own God-directed life while growing in relationship with others. Isn't that, don't we all want that? And what's going to happen is that even if you don't agree with someone, you can still be good friends. I mean, we needed this so much during the pandemic, right? For the last two, two and a half years. There's so many polar opposites, the opinions and, and ideas. Even among Christians, there was so much fight, infighting. But what if we were able to differentiate? And that it's okay to disagree. Right? Hey, by faith, you're going to wear a mask and get vaccinated. Praise God. By faith, you're going to forego the mask and not vaccinated. Praise God. We can still be friends. But only if you're highly differentiated. By the way, in order to see where you're at differentiation, Differentiation because there's actually scale from zero to hundred. Um, bound scale of differentiation, B O W E N, is, is, is a guy, I think, uh, who came up with the, the scale. Um, and so look it up. And on the low scale side, the description reads Can't disting cannot distinguish between fact and feeling, emotionally needy, and highly reactive to others. That's just a couple of examples of this description of, of low differentiated person. Someone who doesn't know what he, he wants or what he thinks. So if somebody would say, oh yeah, Yankees are great. Oh yeah, Yankees are great. Oh, I'm going to vote for this person. Oh yeah, I'm going to vote for that person too. No thoughts of their own. That's someone who has low differentiation. Okay? And then there's the high scale description in which Jesus belongs. He's 100%. He's, he, he's self aware. He, he's walking in true self 100% of the time. And the scale description goes like this principle oriented and goal directed, secure in who they are, unaffected by criticism or praise, are able to leave family of origin and become an inner directed separate adult. Someone who's healthy emotionally. And there's everything in between. So, you know, if you want to know where you are in that scale, look up bounds, scale of differentiation. Okay? That, that's your homework. So let me end with four things you can do to develop your true or authentic self. And this, this can happen only if you begin to peel off the, the, the layers of false self. And it's going to take lots of peeling, some of us. Because our false self is so part of who we are. Okay? I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's, it's going to be hard. It's going to be painful. For some of us, extremely painful to go through this. But it is necessary if we're going to be all that God wants us to be. So, one, pay attention to your interior in silence and solitude. What does that mean? Stop, be still, listen. Stop, be still, listen. It's like stop, drop, roll, right? <laughs> stop, be still, listen. 
Okay? That's what I'm talking about. One way to do this, um, I mean, you really need alone time. You need to put aside time and place where you can be alone. Totally alone. No distractions. So one way to do this is, and especially when we're talking about emotions, take, take time in the morning to journal some of the emotions that are feeling right off the bat and begin to, to, to write down and note pattern in those emotions and ask yourself, why am I so angry all the time? Or why am I frustrated with this person? Why am I anxious when, when it comes to this issue? Why am I so sad or jealous? And begin to sort of pray through that. Also, practice the discipline of solitude and silence. Solitude, being alone, silence, just listening. Okay? Because if you look, read through the Bible, all spiritual giants, every person that, that, are, that are close to God, they always take, spend time alone and listen. Okay? And don't forget to take your Sabbath rest. We talked about this uh, a while ago, right? Taking Sabbath rest once a week where you stop, rest, delight, and contemplate. Okay, revisit the, the message if you need to. But this is crucial if you're going to last, if you're going to run the race the rest of your life, in ministry, in your, your job, in your family. You need to take time to rest once a week. God did it. We're not above God. We need to, to take Sabbath rest seriously if we're going to uh, be in, in it for the long haul. And also, if you're working, take time out to listen to God throughout the day. So in the morning, before you go to work, morning break, lunch, afternoon break, when you come home, and before you go to bed. Take 10, 15 minutes just being silent. You could read scripture, one verse, and just be still and ask the Lord, speak to me right now. And if you practice this daily, it, it can really change, transform your, your, your spiritual life as you uh, really develop this listening skill, listening to the Holy Spirit. Okay? Pay attention uh, to, the, to the interior in silence and solitude. Two, find trusted companions. Someone puts it... Uh, be alone together. <laughs> be alone together. Or be a community of solitude. Does that make sense? Yes, you're, you're, you're your own person, but you're part of a community as well. Right? Um, people who can walk with you in the journey to discover your true self. I mean, we're talking about mentors. Pray about someone who can be your mentor, spiritual director, counselors. Leaders or mature friends or maybe even a spouse, as long as the spouse is not the cause <laughs> for you to, to put on false self, <laughs> okay? Uh, but that's an option as well. Three, move out of your comfort zone. It's not easy transitioning from false self to true self. It's not easy. It can be painful, scary, unnerving, but it's got to be done. And the rewards can be freeing and life-giving. It's hard, but it's going to be freeing and life-giving. I don't know about you, but I, I want to live my life as David Kim, not anyone else. If I had listened to others talk about the church in Nyack, I would have been devastated and, and have quit way before God's time. Maybe in the first three years. Because they said, grow this church this way, grow church that way. A child tell them Nike is different. It's very community oriented. You have to develop one-on-one -on -one relationships. You can't just do big events and, and expect people to come to your church. So we were faithful. We never grew big. But, I mean, it was like a revolving door where people came and went. It was a very transient place. But my prayer is that people, were, people came, was affected, impacted, and, and they can take what they learned and, and take it with them wherever they go to make a difference in their own places. Four, pray for courage. Why? Because whenever you try to differentiate, right, in your family, in the church, wherever, there will be pushback. There will be pushback from the enemy 
and from the people you know and love. People in your family, they'll be like, what's going on? What's wrong? Why are you different? And the enemy will come after us and, you know, I'm not going to try to spiritualize so, too much. As soon as we start the series, what happens in, in this church? COVID happens, right? There's going to be pushback from the enemy and from the people you know and love. Because you, you're changing for the better. But others are staying stuck. Your family members, they don't understand what's going on. They don't want to know. It won't be easy or comfortable, but it is necessary. And you know what? I mean, I can't promise, but as you go through this process, you might even be able to break some negative and harmful multi-generational uh, patterns in your life. I believe that, that that can happen. So you can truly live in the, the life of freedom and the fullness that God promised us to live so that we can make a, an impact, make a difference in the lives of those around us, whether it's family or, or your neighbors or your coworkers. So let me end with the simple, what did I make that really? <laughs> all right, it's not all capital, so I'm not yelling at you. <laughs> St. Augustine, grant, Lord, that I may know myself, that I may know thee. And that's our prayer for today. Let's pray. God, we thank you that we're able to come and Lord, as we hear this message, and, and in the coming weeks, Lord, it might get even more difficult to uncover some things in our lives, to go deep in our soul. But God, give us the grace to be able to face things and trust you, God, that it's all for our, our benefit, for our growth, for our health. So God, we thank you for, for uh, your voice that is louder than every other voice. And God, uh, lead us today, uh, even as we come together in small groups. Lord, um, may the conversation be productive and, and fruitful and helpful, Lord God. And that we will grow together as a church and uh, making a difference in this community. So we thank you and bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to...